united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning. We want to welcome you once again to KSCE's TV program, United with Christ. My name is Patrick Six. I'm the pastor of Scottsdale Baptist Church. We're located at 10015 Lockerbie Avenue. We're over in the east, uh, the east side, close to Album Park. And um, so recently, during one of my quiet times, I came upon a topic that is of great interest to me. Um, so today's program, if I were to give a, meaning, a, a, a title to it, it would be The Meaning of Military Ministry. In Luke chapter 3, there's an account here. Now, it talks about the beginning of the ministry of, of John the Baptist. And uh, I tell you what, that guy was, was really bold in his words. Uh, the first few verses there, verses 3 through 6, talks about the fact that uh, John was the fulfillment of, of prophecy, one of the prophecies of Isaiah. Here's what it says here about him. It says this, describes him this way, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, the rough ways smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. Wow, what a ministry, what a mission to be given. And so as John was fulfilling that ministry and being involved in his ministry, it tells us that the location of that ministry was uh, along the, the Jordan River. I've been very blessed to uh, be able to go to the Promised Land, the Holy Land, uh, Israel, the nation of Israel, and I was able to see the Sea of Galilee. and how that feeds into the Jordan River, and then the Jordan River will flow down into the Dead Sea. So I was blessed to be able to see some of those areas where John the Baptist got to minister. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I just wonder in my own mind how many different people John had the ability to minister to. But this Luke chapter 3 does tell us about some of those people that he was able to minister to. I mentioned to you earlier about how bold he was. Here's some of what he, he said here. In verse 7 it says, He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Now, pastors, if you're watching this program, I don't know about you. I don't know how that would go over in the congregation that you serve, but might not go so well uh, in the congregation that I serve. And I love those people so, so very much as... I'm sure and I hope that you do the congregation that you serve as well. But he was very bold in his approach. But there were so many people who came out to hear him preach. And so, again, in this chapter, it describes some of those. It first talks about large crowds came out to hear him. But then it gets a little bit more specific. It talks about tax collectors who came to hear him. And as they did, they came with their questions. What do we need to do? And so he would respond to them. But there's another group that was mentioned here, and that is the soldiers. Now, as I think about that, I think about the kind of reputation that tax collectors had during that day in Israel. They were not well thought of. They were not well thought of because oftentimes they would... Um, they would extort from the people. They would cheat the people in order to get more money for themselves. But then it addresses the soldiers who came to inquire of John. And as I think about these soldiers, what would they be? Well, more than likely, they were Roman soldiers. So again, probably not a group of people who had the best reputation among those who were in Israel because, again, they would feel abused by them, overpowered by them. But here's the beauty of this. Even those tax collectors had an interest in spiritual things. The soldiers, Roman soldiers, had an interest in spiritual things. And so they would come to John and say, what should we do? What are we to do? And so John's response to them is, 
He said, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. Here's the beauty of what I see in John. Most people would have written these others off, the tax collectors, the soldiers. John didn't. He embraced them. They came to him inquiring about what they needed to do to have a right relationship with God. And he took the time to engage them. He took the time to let them know what it was that they needed to do. And so I'm just thinking about us as a church. When people come to us with that question, what do I need to do? Perhaps we as a church need to ask ourselves the same question. You know, God has blessed us with a great population of people that we call typically Fort Bliss. Those who either reside at Fort Bliss or those who work there. It's a large population who many of them, I'm sure, have spiritual interest, have questions about their own faith. And so as a church, we need to be asking ourselves the same question that those Roman soldiers asked. What should we do? But in terms of this, what should we do to minister to that military segment of our population? And so this morning, I've invited a guest to be with us. His name is Mike Childs. Mike is uh, currently active in active service as uh, Sergeant First Class with the uh, United States Army, and he is also Special Operations Forces. So Mike has also been a voluntary member of our staff as our military minister for about a year now, Mike, I guess that yep. it's so. And during that time, we just have seen exponential growth in the military that we have been able to uh, to minister to who have been have come to the church so i appreciate your your being with us today thank you for joining us thank you for having me pastor you bet so a little bit about i mentioned earlier mike about us having a large population in terms of fort bliss but kind of unpack with me just a little bit about some of the the demographics of that population so here in el paso fort bliss specifically uh pretty unique as far as the army posts go. It's one of the largest posts in the United States and also has one of the largest populations. When just looking at, at soldiers uh, alone, you're, you're around 40,000 soldiers. Okay. And when you bring in, bring in families into that, you're, you're pushing 80, 90,000. And then when you talk about just the population that isn't active duty, isn't a family, but they work, live, uh, serve on Fort Bliss, you're, you're 100,000 plus people here in El Paso that are involved with Fort Bliss one way or the other. It's a pretty large number. When you base that off of the population of El Paso, it's, it's a pretty good chunk. Yes, yes. Which for El Paso, that would uh, mean a lot to us as a city economically as well. Absolutely. Uh, many years ago, I lived in, in Lubbock. And um, at that time, the Reese Air Force Base was located there. But when they decided to close down that Air Force Base, the economy of Lubbock felt the effects of it just immediately. Yeah. And I can imagine it would be pretty much the same way here. Yeah, absolutely. So with that population being, being as large as it is, uh, I'm sure that there's quite a mixture of uh, faiths and, and beliefs as well. Do you have any idea what some of those, those beliefs or some of those faith groups would be? Yeah, I've done research and trying to kind of discern that. It's, there's not a lot of information out there, um, at least that the, the Army doesn't necessarily publish, but there is a multitude of, of faith groups. Um, I mean, I would say the largest would be uh, evangelical or, or Catholic within the, within the mm -hmm. Army, but there, there's quite a few others, um, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu. The, it's, it's definitely a melting pot. It's a, yeah. it's a, the military is a great snapshot of what America is. Mm. Very, very good point. But do you have any kind of percentages on how many of our soldiers and their families would be unchurched? So not getting specific numbers, but just in my, my personal experience and, and being a soldier myself and, and getting to know people and, and seeing chaplains and getting involved with their ministries, 
I would, this is just a Mike uh, estimate, but I, yeah. I would garner to say that there's, I mean, upwards of 75% of the military families are probably unchurched. Okay. And even if you want to go to a conservative number of 50%, I mean, that would be here at Fort Bliss still 50,000 yes. people who, who are unchurched. Wow. Really, you know, you mentioned earlier that it's, it's sort of a representation of <laughs> the America's population. I would think the same thing probably uh, in terms of faith, faith being concerned too, there are, they say that there's the majority of uh, people in the United States would claim to be Christian, but such a small number of people would say that they attend church anywhere. Yeah, I, I've done some of the research that I know Lifeway has put out and uh, like Pew Research and you mm -hmm. know, looking at the demographics of America as a whole. And while you know, there's still a large, you know, 75% of America might claim to be, you know, Christian or, or, or you know, affiliated with, affiliated with some type of religious organization. When you dig a little bit deeper into that, um, those numbers start to shrink as people who are actively involved in, in churches and in their faith. Yeah. Well, for soldiers on the go, I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they, you guys call it PCS. What does that stand it's a for? Permanent change of station. Okay. That's when they move you, they call it permanent, but that means permanent for the next two Semi years or so. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, with that being the case, I, I'm sure that it, there's that temptation there that well, we're going to be here for such a short period of time. We, you know, we're not going to get involved in, in the church. But that being included, what are some other issues and challenges that? Christian soldiers and well, really military families face. I think so. You really have two. You kind of have two demographics in the, in the army. You have the single soldiers, and then you have the, the family units. Mm -hmm. So I mean, each each of those I think face their own their own issues. I and mean, you have the young eighteen, nineteen uh, young men and women who join the military, and next thing they know, they're you know, hundreds, thousands of miles away from home that are out of high school and they're in a totally new environment and living on their own for the first time. And I think there's, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of negative influence in that, in, in that environment. I think okay. young people across America as a whole, and, and you can narrow that down to the military, they're searching, they're, they are searching for something. They're searching to belong, to be a part of, of something, to be a part of community. Mm -hmm. And I think when the church doesn't feel that, they, they'll find it somewhere else and that that I think can be dangerous and, and you you kind of see that with a lot of bad things that come out in the military you know the, the negative press that the military gets a lot I think sure. that's because of the soldiers that are looking for something to belong to and a lot of times that gets filled by not so good things instead of godly things if you yep. will yeah. and then as, as the families go you know it's it is extremely hard for the families to, to up and move every couple years and then when the spouse that is a soldier the active duty spouse when they're here they might not even be here they're training all the time they're working long hours and then they have to the, throw the deployments into that it can be really yeah. challenging on the families um you know that they lose that support group from being back home where they grew up you know the grandparents cousins aunts and uncles you know i grew up with you know all my grandparents and just a slew of aunts and uncles and cousins and we always had family together and we were always together doing things military families you don't get that my kids don't have that like i had growing up and i think that yeah. becomes a challenge of looking for that family okay well one of the things that i've observed while serving at scottsdale baptist church uh, we've been blessed in so many ways because one of the things that i've seen is that many military families will they don't spend a lot of time looking for a lot of churches, it appears to me. They will find a church seemingly quickly. They will get plugged in as, as quickly as they can. And at least what, I've, what I have seen from them is they tend to get really plugged in fast and they, they want to serve uh, quickly for as long as they are there. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that the, the Christian families especially, you know, already have their faith, already, you know, walking with the Lord. They want to get plugged in and they want to keep that, you know, they don't want to have that break in, in, in the church when mm -hmm. moving around. But I think the difficulty comes when you have those families who they're new to church. They're, they're searching for, for faith um, and, and getting them plugged in and getting them involved. Right. So what are some of the things that a, a 
Well, let me back up because I think I want to save that question for later. Okay. If you could talk to soldiers, I mean, if you could just be before the whole bunch and talk to them about the importance of finding a church home, what would you say to them? It's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that you need to find somewhere you belong, somewhere that you can grow as a young man or a woman or as a young family, that you can grow um, grounded in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that you can be a part of the world, you can be a part of the army, but you don't have to live that sinful life, that you can still partake. You can be a soldier, you can serve your country, but you don't have to live that negative life. And it doesn't have to be all bad. A lot of people join yeah. the military and it's just, they hate it, they hate it, they hate it, they're miserable for three years, four years, five, and then they get out and then they have yeah. nothing bad, or nothing good to say about it. But it doesn't have to be like that. If you can get plugged into a church and have that family here, that support system that maybe you had wherever you came from, it's just, it's second to none. I, I, I always recommend as soon as, so, you know, find a church, you know, doesn't have to be our church. But find right. a church. Yeah, that, that preaches the word and teaches the word of God, Absolutely. right? I yes. mean, that, that would definitely be, uh, be our, our stance. Yes. Um, because you're right. I mean, there are so many influences out there. So I guess the church has an opportunity then to fill a gap that really the military can't so much. So it's, it's difficult. I, I, I love our chaplains, and I'm uh, God willing going to be one uh, here in the near future. And they, they do an amazing job. But the reality of the situation is that the chaplains, are, they're, they're handcuffed a little bit. They are more nowadays filling the role of a you know, mentor, counselor type, type role mm. than pastor. Okay. And they, Jesus Christ can, it's not an open thing anymore in the military. If, if a soldier came to me, if I was a chaplain and a soldier came to me and they were going through some, this difficult season in their life and they were just wanting to give up and life wasn't worth living anymore. And, and I wanted to say, well, you know, it's worth living through Christ and you know, Jesus is the answer. And mm -hmm. you can't, the chaplain really can't say that. Okay. Now, if the soldier comes and says, I, I'm, I'm searching for faith. I want to, I want to know more about Jesus. Then that opens the door to share Christ, but it's not an open evangelistic environment. And that's, that's one of the difficulties for the chaplains. Okay. And, the other thing is one chaplain is, is over around 400 soldiers. Uh, you know, a chaplain oh. serves in a battalion sized element and it's yep. around okay. 400 soldiers. So that chaplain has a large number, you know, single soldiers, men, women, families. Um, so it's, it's a tough, tough environment for the chaplain to operate in. Yeah. Okay. So during the time that I've known you, Mike, I've been able to get to know your heart and you have a heart that wants people to know who Jesus is and that's yes. how they can have a relationship with him. Yes. While at the same time, you're making this transition to um, serve as a military chaplain. So how do you strike that balance? What would that look like for you? It's, it's definitely been something that's been on my mind. It's something that I, I've reached out to other chaplains, uh, friends about and how do they, how do they strike that balance? And, you know, really it comes, what, what it comes down to is living out your faith as a chaplain. Okay. You know, every chaplain, regardless of what denomination or what faith background they have, um, they should demonstrate their faith uh, to the soldiers around them. And I think that if I can demonstrate my faith, what Christ has done for me, then I think that opens the door itself. And, okay. and, and and soldiers will come more openly wanting to know, okay, what is this hope that you have? And I've seen that just as a, a regular soldier, not, not as a chaplain, that as I've started walking with the Lord and living my life and, and experiencing that change that only Christ can bring, mm -hmm. people notice that. And sometimes they notice it and they might p poke fun at you and, and you're, you're different. And you might be on the outside a little bit, but that's not a bad thing. Eventually, people will start coming back to you and, and seeking what you have. Okay. Now, Mike, you weren't born a Christian, right? Nope. You are nope. literally, nope. as Jesus said in John chapter 3, born again. Have there been some soldiers that knew you before you had that relationship with Christ and who 
know you now so they've been able to see that change absolutely it, w it was uh it was a difficult transition i i said i hadn't been walking with the lord long and and i like to say i'd give paul a run for his money as, as chief center but mm. um you know when i made that transition and when i finally you know truly submitted and humbled myself and committed to christ and there was that true change and it, it was it was a little it was difficult at first because the guys that i used to go out and party with or do things mm. uh, i wouldn't do anymore so it, it was difficult at first, but I think when after I was consistent and stayed true to okay. what I was saying, yes, then they saw me in a different light. I wonder how many people are like that in everyday life. Uh, you know, in other words, they might, uh, if they happen to be surfing through and catch this program and I introduce myself as the pastor of Scottsdale Baptist Church, well, then they would look at me at a little bit different light. Mm -hmm perhaps somewhat skeptical saying, well, I'm going to watch your life first. Yeah. So I think that, that that's true of us. And really going back to uh, Luke chapter three, when John was talking to the people, he confronted them with mm -hmm. their sin. And then he told them, you're going to make a change. You know, the, they, the word that we use is repentance, turning away from the life that you were living to live a new life. And so he told them what that was supposed to, to look like. Yeah. Well, so currently you're serving Scottsdale Baptist Church as our military minister. Yes. Uh, so during this time, I'm sure that you've gotten some good ideas about what the church can do to minister to military, like you said, individuals and families who are out there. Share with us some of those things. So it, it was a really, it was a blessing coming into Scottsdale uh, Baptist Church because they already had a, a military ministry and the ministry at the time when I came in, it, it was definitely, they loved soldiers, they loved the military, and they wanted to, to be there and support them. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was, to me, it was, it was almost in a, in a patriotic sort of way. Uh, you know, we, Scottsdale has always done big events for, for Veterans Day and, and, and Memorial Day and different holidays throughout the year to honor the soldiers. And it was great, and I, I truly felt loved as a soldier coming into the church right away. But as we, as they began to serve more in the church and, and eventually come on to the staff, I wanted the church to be more deliberate about reaching Fort Bliss, about to reaching lost soldiers, to ministering to lost soldiers, not just being a patriotic church, okay. but being a church that serves those soldiers with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. And so what are some of the things that we've been able to do since then? So it's really, it's just, it's not hard really just getting the, getting the word out there. There's soldiers and families on post that are looking for churches and I'm not a big social media guy. I don't have social media myself, but social media is a huge tool that churches should leverage and need to leverage. And I know Scottsdale is, is working that, and it's something that we're coming along with, and it, it's been a help. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen, one of the biggest ways that we've gotten military families into the church is through social media. My, my wife is constantly on the, uh, the social media pages that are tied to Fort Bliss, and inviting families to church. And that's, we've seen a lot of growth just in the social media aspect mm -hmm. of getting soldiers to the church. And, you know, the other thing is, is we do have the events. We do have Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and, and you know, getting the word out there, uh, mm -hmm. inviting the soldiers to church, and not just inviting them to church, but getting them to church and getting them plugged in, whether they're a single soldier and getting them plugged into a young adult singles group mm -hmm. or married and getting them plugged into a, a young adults group, uh, a young couples group. And, and being able to really start discipling them. That's, that's the important part, is getting them through the door mm -hmm. is step one, but the most, you, you have to begin discipling them. And the beauty is, is that you're, you're creating missionaries okay. because they're going to leave. Yep. You know, chances are they're not going to stay at Fort Bliss. So if you can get a soldier or a family through the door and disciple them, help them grow in their faith, then you're going to send them out as a missionary in a few years, and who knows where they they could go anywhere around the world and, and share Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's one of the, the painful realities of being in a military town like this because people will come in and we just will fall in love with them. They mm -hmm. contribute so much. And yeah, then we have to kiss them goodbye and send them on their way, but we've been blessed so much by those who have uh, come through our doors. We've been blessed by a lot of military who have retired and decided to stay yeah. at Scottsdale, and I, I'm very thankful for that. Let's talk for a few minutes about deployment, and when soldiers come back, that 
that assimilation back into family life? Because I know that can be a struggle. It is, it is definitely a struggle. Even for a, a strong Christian family, it can be a struggle. And I know Scottsdale, we're feeling the pain of, of deployments right now. We have quite a few of our uh, military families with, with husbands and spouses deployed overseas right now mm -hmm. and trying to minister both to the families back here and to the, to, to the soldiers that are deployed. It is, it's extremely difficult. And, you know, the Army does have, have resources to help, but I think, you know, getting the church to come alongside as well mm -hmm. and help those families. It's just, you know, you got to think whether it's a wife at home or a husband at home um, for six months, nine months, a year when their spouse is gone, they become mom, dad, they become everything. Mm -hmm. And when the spouse comes back home, then it's getting, you know, transitioning back and getting back to the, those roles can be, it can be difficult and it can be a strain yeah. on the family. Yeah, not not just the husband and wife, but the children as well. Yeah, because absolutely. they've gotten used to an entirely new system and now they're going to have to revert back to the way it was as, as best you can because during the time kids have been growing, they've been changing. Yeah. So is there anything concrete that you can see that the church could do to help in that area? Uh, prayer, I mean, it's always okay. always number one, prayer. Um, I mean, counseling, mar you know, marriage counseling, not as... Not waiting for a problem to arise. Being proactive. Being proactive okay. in counseling um, yeah. and, and talking and discussing, you know, the roles in the family, uh, biblical roles in the family and mm -hmm. how to how to get back to that, how to get back to that, that biblical marriage. Okay. Which, again, you know, I'm thinking uh, the Bible, it doesn't seem to say a whole lot about that, that deployment and reassimilation. So mm -hmm. we've got to work really hard at that. Yeah. And it, it just it takes time. At Scottsdale, we've done some, some marriage retreats from time to time that may help, but I wonder if that needs to happen more often and maybe with more intentionality in terms of those who have been deployed that have just come back. We, need, we should have something waiting in, in the wings for I, them. I, that would be a great. I think when it comes to the military, when it comes to, to ministering to, the, to Fort Bliss and the military community, everything, it has to be deliberate. It has to be deliberate. You can't just wait for them to come to you. You have to be deliberate about you know, getting, getting your church out there, whether it's Scottsdale or another church, you have to be yes. deliberate in, in reaching out, getting those soldiers to your church. You have to be deliberate in ministering to them. You have to be deliberate in getting them plugged in if they're new Christians and, and showing them how to serve within the body of Christ. It all has to be de very deliberate, I think. Yep. Well, again, it's been such a blessing to see some of these military families coming in. Like you said, searching. I mean, goodness, we have seen so many start at uh, Scottsdale Baptist Church and through the ministry, which part of that is, is our, our MOPS program, others are preschoolers, mm -hmm. to minister to a lot of military wives who just they need a break from the kids. They, yeah. they need some, some help along the way. Well, Mike, I want to thank you so much for uh, being with us today. And, uh, just, and thank you also it. for your, your service to the, our country as well. Thank you. And thank you again for being with us. We so appreciate your taking part with this.